Hello, everyone, and welcome to CMI Race, a uh, better work culture webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can ask them using the live chat box on the right of your screen, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. And today's session is being recorded and will be shared with you tomorrow for those who book to attend. The event recording will also be available on the CMI website and the CMI YouTube channel. So my name is Matt Jays. I'm delighted to be joined today by experts Dr. Jummy Akuya, Senior Lecturer and Wellbeing Psychologist, University of East London, and, and Advita Patel, a qualified coach and mentor, Managing Director of Comms Rebel, and co-founder of A Leader Like Me. Uh, we'll be discussing ending microaggressions and creating a better work, work culture today. So we'll dive straight in. So good to see you both. Good to be yeah. here, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Jummy, so in the Moving the Dial on Race, we outline there are three different types of microaggression and say so it's important to understand each type. Microassault, microinsult, and microinvalidation. Could you just start out by explaining how these are different from one another? Thank you for that question, Matt. I think the, the first thing to say as a way of setting the scene is in differentiating between the three, um, there is the key factor of intent, which is the intention of the, the perpetrator. With the micro assault, and um, this is when someone intentionally behave in a discriminatory way um, towards an individual from a marginalized group or the entire group itself. Um, but to recognize that it is something that is done intentionally, even though they may not fully appreciate the full intent of the impact on the individual. Micro insults, on the other hand, is unintentional um, against an individual. Again, it's a discriminatory behavior or comment, but it's unintentional. And if I can, you know, give you examples between the two, just so that you, can, you know, kind of understand um, at a deeper level the differences between the two. In the case of micro assault, for example, uh, making a racist joke and then saying it's a, it's just a joke, um, it would not be acceptable. It still would be, you know, have to be taken seriously. Or somebody speaks within a meeting, um, and that individual is ignored. It is considered, that would be considered as micro assault or someone puts forward an idea and, you know, people just ignore that idea, even though it's a valid idea, it's a way of, um, you know, over time that can accumulate and be considered as micro assault. Micro invalidation on the other hand is when you, when an individual demeans or undermines um, the experience of an individual or group, a marginalized group within an organization or within the society. So for example, if um, somebody say, oh, within this organization, everyone progresses without any hindrance, that might be your experience, but that does not become a global experience for everyone. Or if someone says there's no racism in the society, how do you know is that? That might be your experience, but that may not be the experience. So when you invalidate the experience of a group based on your own experience or you undermine it, then you are actually passing uh, micro invalidations. Thanks. That's a, a, as you say, really, really good uh, scene setter. And Advita, drawing from your substantial experience in communications, how have you seen these different types of microaggression manifest in practice? Yeah, I have, Matt, totally. And, and what Jimmy has said is, is I think anyone who's listening today may have experienced or witnessed, if not experienced personally, definitely witnessed these taking place. And it's really interesting when we talk about microaggressions, because when you do speak up, you know, when you do have the confidence to speak up and tell people that, oh, you know, I feel excluded from this conversation. Is there any particular reason why, why you've excluded me? People get quite defensive. Uh, and that's what tends to happen in some of the organizations that I have um, been brought in to do some support work with them when it comes to inclusion and the power of language is very important. I know we'll get onto that a bit later on today, but it's, it's really important to kind of think about you know, and, and all of us have a responsibility regardless of what our kind of backgrounds and diverse, um, diversity uh, underrepresented um, qualities are, if you want to call it that, um, to, to call, it, call it out and, and be, be confident enough to do that. So I do think that a lot of organisations probably do experience this more than they think they do. 
you know, and it's not as blatant as being uh, as saying a racist joke. I think most of people understand that racism and racist jokes are not acceptable. It's those tiny little things that add up. And I think I, I said it on our pre-call. It's the uh, it's the analogy the uh, the uh, death of a thousand cuts, uh, and that's how I kind of see microaggression. It's it's building on that. And you know, one paper cut doesn't really feel anything, but I do it a thousand times over and over again. It can really impact the way you live and breathe and the way you're made to feel about working in that particular organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jummy, you know, you're obviously lead advisor on our CMI race, moving the dial on race uh, practical guide. And we're saying that, you know, when left unaddressed, these comments and behaviors become permissible and normalized in organizational culture and that better managers make it a point to intervene by challenging underlying biases and assumptions. Uh, you also provided some tips for managers encountering microaggressions and perhaps you could talk us through these, please. Um, the thing to mention here is that ignoring microaggression is a no-no. Uh, it's got to be addressed. You've got to respond to it. You just have to decide how you want to respond to it. Uh, it, it could be the case of you want to respond to it immediately, which can be very powerful because if you respond to it immediately, the event and the incident is still fresh in your memory. And also in terms of letting the perpetrator understand the impact of what they've done, um, it, it, the, the power of immediacy kind of, you know, helps for you to kind of bring the story back to life or let them see um, the full impact of what they've done but definitely choosing to respond in a way that is appropriate, in a way that, you know, respect and honor your own um, attachment to the subject or to what has happened. So responding would be the, you know, the starting point, but also to discern whether the, the subject and what has happened is important to you and the relationship you have with the individual was, you know, committed the microaggression. So you need to discern um, how much of emotional investment do I want to put into this? So not feeling under pressure that you have to, you know, respond to every single microaggression. That might sound counterintuitive because I just said respond, but you don't have to pick up on every of it. So there would be some that would be really important to you that you feel that you must, you know, respond to it. But also maybe the relationship that you have with the individual was, you know, just um, committed the microaggression towards you might make, help you to actually help to understand, have a conversation with them. So discerning which one to respond to and how quickly you want to respond. Because don't forget that when you experience a microaggression, a lot of emotions can be attached to it, can you know, come alive, could be anger, it could be you know, frustration. So to think of whether you want the emotions to simmer down before you respond so that you can respond in a calculated way, in a way that is you know, appropriate to what has happened because emotions can actually take over the event, but also to disarm the individual was, you know, who, who is the perpetrator. And what I mean by that is to actually call it out and actually be willing to challenge what they've said or what they've done and make them see how that impacts you because they might not have the intent of doing what they've done or to make you feel the way you feel, but to actually let them see what has happened and how you feel about it. Uh, a, a big part of this is the awkwardness of actually you know, challenging someone and you know, telling them that what they've done make you feel a particular way. Um, and it's you know, feeling comfortable with that discomfort and saying, we are both going to actually sit with this and have a conversation until you understand how what you've done actually impact me. Because it's not about the intent of the perpetrator, it is the impact of the, of the, of the victim or, or the person who's experienced it. The final one is defining. So kind of, you know, defining and understanding what's the reason behind it and how far are you willing to go to kind of, you know, challenge it in the future, but also clarifying, um, getting to the bottom of the behavior or the root of, of the behavior by asking more questions to understand why, what that person said you know, why that person will say it and how it impacts you. So to kind of, you know, clarify and asking more questions so that you have a better understanding and know where the, the, the comment or the behavior is coming from. So definitely um, defining and clarifying and asking more questions to understand um, the intent and the purpose uh, would be um, highly recommended. 
Thanks ever so much. And Advita, your company, Comms Rebel, specializes in internal communication and employee experience consultancy. So what experiences can you share of organizations supporting managers to challenge microaggressions? And uh, perhaps, you know, what advice would you give to people who are experiencing microaggressions from their own managers? Uh, on, on the first question, Matt, it's all about psychological safety when it comes to these conversations and people uh, want to feel safe to be able to raise the concerns that they have or the challenges that they're facing and in order for managers to be able to ask uncomfortable questions as well all of what we're talking about today is about learning and educating and understanding as Jimmy quite clearly said what it means and why they're doing you know the behaviors that they're demonstrating and people always get you know we've seen all out there right we've seen people get defensive and get fragile when you talk about something and organizations have a a part to play in making sure that they put the systems in place where people can raise concerns in a safe way and be dealt with you know well, the last thing I've, I've witnessed in various organizations they'll put in um a database or they'll put on some form that people can raise concerns confidentially but then it kind of goes into a, a black hole of nothingness and that's the worst thing i think you can do as an organization ask people to express how they felt unleash some of those emotions and then not do anything with it and, and that's you know it adds it comes on top of it so as organizations you have a responsibility and as managers we all have a responsibility to make sure that we are following through with what how our people are feeling and our colleagues are feeling because everybody's uh, emotions are valid whether you agree or disagree at that moment in time it's important that you hear from them and you hear what what they are saying and why they're saying what they're saying as well and i think sometimes organizations think that doing a diversity equity inclusion uh, and belonging policy is enough you know words on a paper file it away it's on the intranet for you to download but actually putting the actions what does it actually mean what behaviors do we expect our business to demonstrate when it comes to um, all things race all things diversity all things equity inclusion you know what how do we expect our managers to react to some of these situations and and leading you know and it does has to, it does have to come from uh, the top at times as well it, you know everybody has a part to play in terms of the trickle or the rumble as i call it you know and beating that drumbeat but if your senior leaders are not demonstrating some of those behaviors then whatever you're trying to implement in the organization you're going to struggle with so i would definitely think about uh, the systems you've got in place what are those systems actually there to do and what actions are you expecting people to do and the behaviors that you want people to demonstrate and giving them the safe space to be able to ask those questions and giving them the tools and the techniques, because it takes, you know, it's a, it's a technique as a leader and a manager to understand how to ask some questions. You may have to ask an uncomfortable question. Uh, a friend of mine um, he talks about crossing a minefield, you know, and, and she says it's quite easy for her to say, stay in her comfort zone and not cross that minefield, because if she crosses it and she gets it wrong, she's scared of getting burnt and she's scared of, you know, being injured and, and failing. And she'd rather not go down that path and stay in her safe zone and just accept what's going on because otherwise you know what if she looks like an idiot and what if she gets called out as a racist or a sexist or whatever and i said to her you know it's not about not crossing that minefield it's making sure that you've got people on the other side to help you cross it safely so lean into people you know like organizations like yourself matt you know cmi and look at the resources that are available to help you develop tangible um and, and impactful strategies and policies and actions that actually make uh, an impact in, in the business. Absolutely. And we've already had a couple of great questions following on from that. So uh, Ryan's actually asked, what are ways managers can create psychological safety in their own behaviours and leading day to day? Uh, Jami, could you perhaps come in on that one to Ryan? Yes, definitely. Um, I'm already smiling um, just by that question, psychological safety, happens to be um, a topic that I think all managers should invest in understanding and um, also think of practical ways that they can, you know, um, ensure that it is present within their teams. Um, and, you know, one of the ways to actually, you know, role model that as a leader is demonstrating that you don't know everything uh, because psychological safety is actually demonstrating a learning behavior, um, creating an environment where you can take interpersonal risk with team members and you can own up and, you know, when you make mistakes. So a leader who comes forward to say, 
have done something wrong or we've we've got it wrong is a way of demonstrating that it is safe to actually expose yourself and once the leader can you know lead with example by showing that that will be one example of how you can promote psychological safety because at the end of the day you don't want people hiding behind a mask or when they've got something wrong they don't feel comfortable to show it or when they need to learn something they can you know put themselves forward to say i'm not sure i'm good enough for this i need extra help so promoting that kind of environment within the team then allows people to be the whole self within the team and that promotes you know productivity and you know and people being you know the be their best self within within the work work environment so it, to answer that question leaders would need to role model that behavior themselves by you know putting their hands up to say i'm not 100% sure about this or willing to learn or showing that they they've got something wrong Thanks ever so much. And uh, another question came through actually whilst you were speaking, Avita, on um, what can employees do when organisations never seem to take action on grievances, um, seemingly wanting them to drift away without closing the process? Now, in our Moving the Dial on Race practical guide, um, we actually uh, had some leaders, a bit like Jeremy was saying, actually open up about their own organisations and some of the concerns that have been raised by their own uh, staff. So. Um, for Ian, what would be your advice there? What can employees do? It's too, uh, I'm all about, so a part of my, uh, when I speak to, uh, as a consultant to organisations who may be feeling that leaders are not doing what they're meant to be doing is to build up your data and it's to build up your evidence in terms of the impact it's having on individuals. The, the reason I say this is because when you go to a leader and say, or an organ, you know, or a top of the organization and say, people are feeling like you're not taking grievance seriously and this is what's going on, it can be quite a sweeping statement. What I find is quite powerful is when you go with actual data and evidence to say, X, Y, and Z, this is what's going on, these are the dates it happened, and this is the this is the impact it's had, and we've lost some lost some good talent we've not we're not doing innovation in here performance is dipping sickness is high we're losing you know we're losing good people in this organization because of the reluctance of dealing with it it takes you know and i'm not ian i'm not saying that it's easy to do this it takes a level of confidence and um reassurance from your leaders and your peers and your community around you to go and step into this space because it's, it's it's hard to do that right because you you convince yourself that you don't want to be that disruptor you don't want to be that troublemaker you don't want to be the one that's always kind of causing the scene because all you want to kind of do is go in and do a good good job but culturally and values you know it doesn't sit comfortable with you so it does take a certain level of confidence to go into that room and say to people here's the data that i've collected over the last three months and this is the feedback i've had the other thing that works really well is going in with verbatim uh, and i i anonymize the verbatim but i do go in with real stories because the part of comms obviously is storytelling and going in with real stories of putting the human behind some of the reactions that's happened and the, and the challenges that's been that's taken place because you've not dealt with the grievances can really can really help leaders understand the impact their lack of action is having across the organization so going in with uh, verbatim having some evidence trying to understand what the barriers are for those leaders what is their worry as jimmy quite said you know people are very people feel that they have to have a mask on when they get to a certain level and are very scared to show their vulnerability and they don't want to be seen as somebody who doesn't know the answers to everything and this area is so complex that it's impossible for any human regardless of how involved you are in this work to know the answer to every single thing but it's about having and opening up those doors and having those collaborative conversations so trying to understand what is those barriers and ultimately and to be really frank you know if the organization is not dealing with those grievances properly for whatever reason you know if, if they're just stopping and they're blocking you may need to question whether you want to commit to that organization whether it you know would it, whether you want to progress your career with that organization because you've got to put your own mental health and well-being first as well over all of this avita i wanted to um add to what you just said because you've you've clearly just mentioned um really good practical um steps there but also the final point you made about thinking about your own long-term well-being and your mental health is that an organization where you want to continue your career that would be a good question to ask yourself if in the long term you don't see any changes around that 
then you may have to you know think twice maybe you need to you know take your skill set somewhere else yeah 100% because you know if these organizations don't catch up with what's going on across the globe then eventually they will they will die out you know whether they like it or not the generation that's following me and and my friends children when i listen to them talk they are you know they're not going to put up with some of the nonsense that we my generation and the generation ahead of me have put up with in their in their careers and lives that you know they go off and they build their own systems and they build their own companies and you lose that talent and you lose that innovation and those companies who are re refusing to move forward and refusing to embrace diversity and inclusion I guarantee within 10 years they'll they'll go if they're not bringing in that new talent and new skill set because people will ask those questions the questions that my parents were scared to ask that i'm starting to ask and, and i'm still willing to help them my friends children won't do that my friends children will be like i'm out of here i'm going to create my own company i'm going to go somewhere where i'm respected and they won't, they won't put up with that nonsense um, and that's what they need to kind of remember in an organization is are you prepared to you know take take on board some of the commentary and what's going on and, and have longevity uh, because those organizations just won't thrive they won't uh, i can guarantee it absolutely and i know we're going to discuss this um a lot more um there's some there's a lot of questions coming through which is fantastic though so i think it could be a good opportunity to go to a couple more so we've had a question from ali come in saying how can we empower staff to call out microaggressions from their manager um but I'd also like to kind of take on uh, Reshika's question. Uh, it was aimed at you, Advita, uh, saying, I'm a consultant and seconded to another organization. What is the best way to approach this when you're representing your company with a, within a client environment? And I think, you know, there's something about empowerment here. We've spoken a little bit about the, um, the emotional exhaustion there is to be calling out microaggressions. Um, but the importance of it. So I suppose two two similar questions. One is how do you empower staff? And then secondly, if you're in a slightly atypical situation, how 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 do you go about kind of feeling empowered to call out microaggressions um, in that in that client's environment? So perhaps um over to you, Advita first and then Jamie. It's a it's a tough one when you go in as a consultant because you are, you know, uh, you're not part of the kind of colleague set up if you want to call it that but you you've got a bit of a unbiased view i suppose of what's going on in that business so you've got an umbrella view of what's happening so you're in a bit of a position where you could potentially use that knowledge and that experience to raise the concerns and the questions that you've got and hold those leaders accountable in terms of what you've witnessed in the short term that you've been there as a consultant um, and it does you know and that's quite powerful and i recognize that when i move from in-house world into consultancy i recognize that a lot of those leaders who brought me into work with them were more were willing whether it's right or wrong you know we could, that's a different discussion but they were more willing to listen to me as a consultant because i went in there as, a, as an observer to an extent to help them understand you know how to improve their practices and i and i went in again like i said to ian going in with some evidence and going in with some um, actual examples of what's going on in the business and what I witnessed and how I can help them and support them in improving their practices. So it is about, you know, it is, a, it is that, you know, showing them and demonstrating them, demonstrating to them where you have seen some of the challenges that you've witnessed and how it's kind of impacted. And again, building that data set up as a consultant, you can do it in house as well, but as a consultant, you are a little bit more detached. So you're not going in emotionally, you know, you are going in a little bit more as a, like I said, an unbiased view to kind of be uh, a little bit more pragmatic with what, what, what you witnessed and leaders tend to react better to that in my experience. I don't know if Jimmy's got um, other top tips and, and advice. I think yeah, and Avita, you you um, you've given some really good pointers, but I think the one I, I would like to extend a bit is you coming in as an external person, you are able to give that unbiased you know opinion of how you see things, and also because your job doesn't depend on you know what you're doing there as, as, as with the clients, you're able to give that um, open, honest. Um, comment about what you see because as an employee of the organization you might be a bit reserved to kind of you know give them that you know full view comment about what you what you're experiencing but as a consultant who is probably you know maybe there for a couple of months and you're reviewing something for them you're able to you know see what you see you're able to kind of you know um 
present it in a way that you can give them that you know feedback and um, review and opinion of what you've seen in a way that they can work with it and your your your, your progression or your future um, career doesn't depend on you know what you what you share with them but i really want to comment about the question about empowerment how can you know people be empowered to call out mic microaggression i think one of the ways um, to empower um, employees or individuals within organization would be from the culture within the organization itself. If the culture you've seen is that of quick response from leaders actually responding to previous complaints of microaggression that's been called out and has been dealt with, that should empower you or give you the confidence to actually do the same. But if what you've heard and seen is that around here, people don't call out microaggression. If you do, you get blamed for it or it goes nowhere then you're more kind of unlikely to, to, you know, kind of come forward and say, this is what I've seen, or this is what I've observed, or this is what has happened to me, even with the data and evidence that you may have. If you already know that the culture here is, is not dealt with, um, and maybe he's even, you know, swept under the carpet. But also one of the ways that organizations can empower the employees to actually um, call out mic microaggression is through their policies and practices. So maybe to have practices in place where and the process of reporting something like that is anonymized in a way that you can, you know, um, put forward a complaint about what you've what you've seen, what you've noticed, what you've observed, or what has happened to you, in a way that maybe it cannot be traced back to you, but it's, it can still be dealt with. So I've seen organisations where they've set up a system where you can, you know, use an anonymized in inbox for you to send a message in. They will deal with it. Um, call the perpetrator um, to order without mentioning your name if you want it that way. So having clear set of um, practices in place that send that positive message and signal to employees that you're serious about it and that you have that zero tolerance policy around microaggression because that will send a very strong message to you know perpetrators. Absolutely. And, you know, as we say, uh, managers are crucial to uh, instilling a culture of zero tolerance to racism and the inclusive culture that you're talking about, Jamie. Um, I am going to come to another question shortly. So um, please do keep asking uh, the questions in the comments. Um, but I suppose yeah. if in the past year, um, you know, we have seen lots of people move to remote working and these kind of digital engagements like we uh, are having right now. Um, so I think, you know, before we move on from microaggressions, um, it'd be good to explore kind of the move to digital and what that might have meant um, for microaggressions. So just to set the scene a little, in a recent CMI Insight article on digital microaggressions, um, working at home makes us more vulnerable in situations with colleagues, but it also makes us more comfortable this is a perfect storm for microaggressions to become more prevalent. The individuals doing the microaggressing may not be aware that they are making people feel uncomfortable. As far as they're concerned, they're expressing themselves in a more relaxed way. So perhaps the future, if I come to you, how might the move to remote working and greater digital interaction play out in terms of microaggressions and creating better work culture? Um. I think the the thing to remember Matt, about digital and working from home is that you are in a relaxed environment. You know, you're in your own space and you've got comfortable. So it's it's you're kind of not being held to account, right, to an extent, because normally you're surrounded by colleagues and you're having a conversation and you understand, you know, what's right and wrong. But sometimes you can slip into that those microaggression practices, things like, you know, a, a practical example I'll give is that when you're on a Zoom call or a Skype call or Teams call or whatever, and you over talk when someone is talking on a, on a you know, somebody's trying to get the point across on, on, a, on a conversation. Uh, and you do it several times because it's hard. We get it, you know, when people try to get the point across, it's difficult when you're working digital and you're trying to make sure everyone's heard. But when it's been over, done over and over again by somebody or you cut somebody off or you mute them or you kick them out the room, because they're grazing something that you're uncomfortable with. I've heard of that. I've heard people being booted out of a, of a room um, or, or being put on mute by the organiser just so they can get the point across. Those things are not acceptable. You would not do that in an office environment. Well, I hope you wouldn't. You know, I hope you wouldn't escort somebody out of a room that way. Um, and it, it's not acceptable on a, on a call. And things commenting on things like, oh, you've got your washing out 
oh what kind of wallpaper have you got going on there oh is that your is that somebody who sat in the background and i get it and it's quite interesting you know it's, it's interesting to ask those questions and you think you're getting to know that individual but it's the tone that you're asking some of those questions right and that's what you need to be aware of when you are asking and, and you're noticing things in someone's environment because that's their safe space uh, and microaggressions can play out quite a lot in those in those uh, environments in itself like for example christmas time uh, a colleague of um, a, a client i was working with a colleague had raised that somebody had questioned why they haven't they didn't have christmas decorations up in their house and then went on to call them grinch and misers and etc uh, and, and and it's due to religious um, reasons they didn't have a christmas tree up in in their in their home but people didn't acknowledge that that person was made to feel excluded from the conversation and was made to feel because they didn't have a Christmas tree and Christmas decks up, all of a sudden they were seen as a, a miser and a Grinch and couldn't contribute, you know, so there's no point asking them to contribute to the Christmas um, uh, Santa, you know, secret Santa, because you're obviously a Grinch, you know, and it's things like that, that I just think you need to be really conscious of when, when you are uh, doing more and we're going to move into more hybrid working right that's reality you know over time you know I think a lot of organizations are going to be looking at how can we uh, work in, in an organization but also work from home and people are going to have a bit more balance I hope so just being conscious about reacting to um, to people's bedroom you know if they're sitting in the bedroom not everyone has because it, it impacts social economic right so not everyone has the luxury of an office dedicated just to them commenting on their bedspread and all that kind of stuff is is an element of a microaggression to be fair to be honest sorry sure okay and so jamie what's your experience from the university of east london has the move to digital raised any new issues to deal with i think one of the issues that i've, I've kind of you know, experienced over and over again is the kind of on-demand culture so people expecting kind of 24 7 response from you because we're virtual. So I'll give you an example of a student that sent me an email at 10.30 at night, and by 9 a.m. in the morning, he had sent another one with a question mark asking me, why haven't you responded? Um, he's under the impression that if I'm not going to meet you in a classroom, you should be available via email anytime. And you see, it's, it's even the tone of the email sometimes that can actually cause anxiety or even make you feel kind of this person has been aggressive towards me in the way that they're writing. So, but they're not aware of that. They're, they're thinking, I'm just putting my point across. I need an answer to this ASAP or, you know, um, right away. So it's understanding how we communicate and how our communication is perceived by the other party. But more importantly, work life integration um, is almost going badly so there is no that clear cut line so the, the lines are blurred completely right now where people continue to walk and that expectation on the other side of i expect you to be there to respond on demand 24 7. um it, it, it's it's a it's a passive aggressive way of you know dealing with situation which i think um is almost blowing over in a, in a sense and i certainly have heard from some of my colleagues not at the university of east london alone but other academics saying you know the virtual environment is you know causing some you know tension and um, especially between academics and students and whereby for example you might be delivering lecture and you have maybe 50 60 students on the call and um, not a single you know face um on the screen so everyone is you know they have their, their, their video, you know, kind of, you know, um, shut down. Um, you're, you're not, you know, getting any response, but you kind of trying to um, encourage engagement. And at the end of it, you just get goodbye, kind of, you know, a message saying thank you, bye. Um, so it feels as if you haven't actually created that environment where there is, you know, um, both ways interaction between, you know, student lecturer. But I think is that demand of I'm sending you a message, you must respond at any time of the day or night. And that is something that needs to be you know, looked at and how that is impacting on the well-being of academics and, and their mental health. Because I, I definitely can say it's creating some level of tension and anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it goes back to the point we were making earlier about managers creating uh psychological safety for their teams and the you know the change to remote working for many 
uh, is you know requiring much greater communication skill as uh, CMI's uh, management transform research quite rightly pointed out. Um, I do want to go back to Mahendra's uh, question, which was how can we benchmark microaggression, race, the uh, rhetoric and realities regarding the actions and remedies taken by organizations, uh, especially when the role of line managers are concerned. And this actually picks up on a, a point from our research report for moving the dial on race, where we found there was a perception gap between um, what was being said and what was being done. And we actually found that different groups as well, um, there were differences. So uh, employees from uh, diverse ethnic groups were more likely to say that the actions being taken uh, were less likely than uh, white employees and white managers. So there's an interesting question here about kind of benchmarking the rhetoric and reality. Uh, perhaps if I come to you, Evita, first on that. Do you know what? It's a hard one, Matt. I'm going to I'm going to admit because I do think it's difficult to benchmark. And Jimmy, may, you know, Jimmy's I know has done lots of research in this area of work, so may have uh, a different uh, outlook on this. But I do think that benchmarking things can also lead to poor behaviour, personally. Um, and it's really important to understand why we, you know, what that benchmark means means for uh, across the across the microaggressions across organisations, because every culture is different, right? And every culture has its own ways of working. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't know, is it? How could we do it? Is it needed? Do you think? Is it something that has come out of of research? People saying we need a benchmark uh, around microaggressions. I'm not. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with that, and I wouldn't even know, to be honest with you, where to even start. Uh, with that area of work. So I'm going to I'm going to hand it over uh, to our expert resident here and see if Jimmy's got any thoughts and ideas on on this. <laughs> now I think the way to look at the way I understand the question, if I understand it correctly, is uh, you're asking um, how to benchmark um, the rhetoric, what's been said, and what in 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 reality what employees are experiencing. I think this is all about constantly monitoring and measuring the experiences of individuals within the organization because it's not enough for organization to say we do our best and um, make sure that um, we punish or respond to um, complaints of you know microaggression as adequately as we can but what are the evidence of how you're monitoring that and what are you doing constantly to ensure that and people feel that sense of support. I'll give an example at the University of East London. Um, we have um, dignity advisors. So these are individuals that work with an HR. Um, and some of them actually they're trained, but they're not specifically HR professionals, but they're in different schools. And their, their role is to support individuals who may have experienced some kind of harassment, bullying, or um, any, any kind of you know, microaggression but don't feel comfortable to go directly to HR. So they will speak to this dignity advisor as a point of uh, contact. We would then advise them, listen to the, you know, the incident and what has happened. Um, and then that person becomes like a support structure with then report it to HR. So HR then documents it, takes some action about it. So I suppose the role of the dignity advisor then is almost like a, a middleman, someone that you know, is readily there like a colleague that you can, you know, speak to. And that kind of helps in terms of tracking and how are we doing as an organization, how many complaints have we had and have we dealt with it so that, you know, that some kind of evidence can be presented. But when you're looking at benchmarking, so how are we doing as an organization as against to other organizations, how are they dealing with it? I think that's also very difficult because I don't see many organizations wanting to kind of reveal how many microaggressions are happening within their organization unless you speak to people informally, you know. Um, so I think it's all about what the organization is doing to support individuals to feel comfortable to come forward and maybe not directly to HR because you might be worried about how that, you know, how you might be perceived as an individual or how that might impact your career progression within the organization. But speaking to a dignity advisor can be at a level where you're anonymous and that dignity advisor then becomes the person that you know goes forward to present the case. I hope that answers the question. 
Can I uh, well, can I also yeah. add? Uh, sorry, Matt. Can I can I also add that if you are interested in this area of work and understanding benchmarks, I suggest check out an organisation called Culture Shift. Uh, so Culture Shift uh, basically provide um, software to organisations where people can raise uh, confidentially and anonymously. Uh, challenges that they faced uh, and microaggressions that they faced and they've been tracking some of the kind of responses and the impact that it's had and it started off in universities but I know they've expanded to other organizations so they've got lots of reports on their website so have a look at cultureshift.co.uk uh, and I think you might find some really interesting data behind some of the research that they've done basing, basing uh, using the system that they've got in place sorry so I just thought that while Jimmy was uh, talking about comparing organizations and, and challenges because people don't like to share uh, those kind of things. But I know Culture Shift have been doing some uh, matching of data across different organizations. That's really interesting. And uh, do let us know in the comments, Mahendra, if that answered your question in the way you're hoping. Um, and I, I think, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, the Moving the Dial on Race uh, Practical Guide. Jami, you obviously in that stated the importance of employee resource groups as well to build that support, uh, to get that kind of sounding board. Um, and we explored that in one of our earlier webinars and we're actually going to revisit it um, in a specific webinar on building support with um, MACE group and their um, employee resource group for ethnicity. So we'll definitely dive into that subject um, a lot, a lot more. And it seems as though you did answer uh, the question uh, as it's come through in comments. So. Um, a point back to perhaps um, Jamie's uh, earlier contribution. So Marina says on-demand culture can be helped by discussing and managing expectations, um, which I think you know we would we would all agree with. But I suppose this 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 kind of starts bringing us back to uh, our original starting point for the conversations and the conversations that we've had uh, backstage, as it were. Um, you know, about different differing experiences about conversations and discussions that occur in the workplace. So perhaps before we move on to um, discussing uh, inclusive culture more broadly, um, I know both of you are uh, have kind of stories or examples um, that you are happy and willing to share um, with, with the audience. So um, perhaps, Jamie, if I start with you and, and, and Vita, then over to you about the kind of specific um, examples that you think are really powerful. Yes, um, the story I want to share is, um, I was reflecting about this last night as I was thinking of this um, event today and I was just thinking part of, you know, speaking at an event like this is willing to be vulnerable and, you know, sharing your own experience um, for people to take learning away. And one of my, you know, earlier experience, you know, many, a few years back, um, actually, I had two managers, both of them female. And my experience was that when I go and see one, um, the, the, the space and the gap she would give me when she's talking to me was wider. And even in her presence, I find out that when I go there with you know, so many ideas that I want to go and share with her as to how I want to you know, um, launch a new project, um, she has a way of shutting me down. And even when she doesn't even express I expressly say, don't, you know, don't go any further. I feel like I can't continue talking to her. Then I'll go to the other manager who is also female. And she would pull a chair so close to me and I'll end up, you know, saying so much. Um, we might book a 30 minutes meeting and it will end up to be like, you know, 45 minutes. So I'll spend more time with her or less time with the other person. But when I leave the presence of this, you know, manager that doesn't, you know, give me that much, um, 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 attention and, and space to talk, um, I start to doubt myself whether the ideas that I'm coming up with are, you know, really valuable or useful. And I feel kind of rubbish about myself, even though I knew that what I was doing was, you know, good and, you know, uh, um, adding value to the organization. But what I, what I want to draw to your attention is the fact that what both managers were doing without them knowing one was actually encouraging me to flourish and be my best self and share ideas and go out and try some of those ideas just by the way she listens to me, she encourages my ideas. The other was being microaggressive towards me. But I didn't know the words for it at that time and I didn't know that was what was happening because even as soon as I enter office, a posture changes and I feel almost kind of you know belittled 
from the way she would talk to me. And I think it's reflecting on that. And I kept on blaming myself. Is it the way I presented myself? Is it the way I say things? But to recognize that individuals can, you know, by their behavior, by their comments, um, intentionally or unintentionally uh, be, you know, aggressive towards you in a micro way. And that's why it's called microaggression. Uh, it is person to person interaction. And sometimes you really have to prove it, even to the person, to the perpetrator, that what you're doing makes me feel this way. This is how I'm experiencing you. This is how it's impacting me. And I think it's important for us to, you know, uh, for you as a, as a person at the receiving hand, not to be the one to constantly have to prove that this is how I'm feeling for the person to know that I shouldn't be doing this. So that's that. That's my story. So, you know, thinking about those two managers, how one actually allowed me to blossom in my role and did really well. And the other person almost kind of um, diminished my contribution just by, just by the way they're behaving. And to think of, you know, the cumulative effect of that on an organization, if leaders, you know, don't pay attention to you know something as subtle as that so how do we come across how do we you know encourage how do we amplify the voices of you know maybe an underrepresented person and you know but action or even of you know non-verbal you know um, body language can, can come across as um, negative that would be my story absolutely so i mean you know and it sounds like really one of the first things for a manager is to really um a first sign i suppose to look for is if if you have someone in your team that you feel is uh, not giving their best or not um achieving their best you know then it's a good time to step back and actually question that how you're managing that person and whether you're giving them the space and whether you are actually uh, perpetrating any uh, specific microaggressions so that's a really really clear example jamie thank you and Advita, perhaps, um, you know, maybe if we wrap, um, you know, your your experience around a leader like me, you could perhaps just explain a little bit about, um, you know, what that is, uh, what you do and, and uh, you know, your experience um, of microaggression. Yeah, um, so a leader like me was created uh, a year ago in January 2020 when I actually spoke to uh, Priya Bates, who's one of my co-founders, because I asked her to be my mentor uh, because I just set up my own consultancy and I was looking for somebody who I could relate with, who could understand some of the challenges I could face. As Priya is another South Asian communicator who set her own business up about you know, 10, 10, 12 years ago. So I really valued her experience and I knew as being a South Asian woman and a woman of colour working in the industry that I work in, where there's not many people who look like me in the industry, there may be certain challenges and microaggressions that I potentially could face uh, and I wanted to have somebody who understood everything I was going through and it's in this conversation actually that Priya and I just you know had a conversation about our own experiences and what led us to set our own businesses up and why we're doing what we're doing in that day and one of the key things that came out of that conversation was not seeing leaders who looked like us in senior positions or, or allies or sponsors who could understand what it's like to be underrepresented in the business that we work in. And, and all the conversations that we've had today, it can, as, as Jimmy said, it can accumulate into something where you start doubting your own abilities. And you start thinking that you're not worthy of that space or you you know you think you're a fraud or you feel like you're not you don't belong in that space uh, imposter syndrome we've all heard of it right we've, we, we've all at one point in our careers probably experienced it as well so we decided to create a safe uh, space a community um starting off with women of color uh, across any industry who wanted to um gain a bit of confidence and some support in dealing with things like microaggressions and challenges that may face because a part of understanding microaggressions is is uh, is and uh, challenging microaggressions sorry is having that confidence to do so right and not feeling like you're the one that's uh, uh, imagining the situation or you're the one that doesn't you know you're the one that's going to be rocking the boat you know you need to keep your head down because ultimately you, you're lucky to be in that job because you've convinced yourself you're lucky to be in that job because you don't see other people who look like you in that environment. So it, it kind of all kind of feeds into this. So we recognise that if we created a programme where we could enhance the confidence, build a community, a safe space where people could, could have those conversations, then some of these situations of microaggressions would be pulled out a bit quicker rather than, as I said at the beginning, you know, rather than the analogy of that death by a thousand cuts because it can make a big it can really impact you mentally 
uh, and, and, and your own self-worth and self-esteem can take a big hit in all of this. And I'm just going to touch on a, a very, I've written a blog about this story. So uh, I'm sure Matt will share the link if anybody wants to know a little bit more detail about it. But microaggressions for me and why I'm so passionate about the work that I do is I worked with um, a, a, a person uh, called, her real name isn't Sam, but I'm going to call her Sam for the purpose of this story. Uh, and Sam was this amazing black communicator, a uh, black woman, vibrant, amazing, credible in everything that she did. And I remember the microaggressions that she faced in the organization that I worked in. And I was fairly new in the profession and, and, and in my career. And I didn't know what microaggressions were at that time. I wasn't aware of it, but I recognized that she was being treated differently than everybody else. So uh, Sam had just come back from having breast cancer surgery. And she, I remember her asking for um, a special chair to to help uh, with her healing and surgery. and and the. Uh, it got granted, you know, the leader said, yeah, it's fine, you can have the chair. But when she left that room and I was just finishing off my work, uh, the, the leader said to the other leader, well, I hope that now means that she's going to actually do some proper work and she's got no excuse. And that shook me, you know, at the age of 23, 24, I was a bit like, oh, my goodness, like, that's a bit harsh. Like, she just come up from some life changing surgery. Can't believe they said this, but I didn't know how to deal with it. I just heard them, you know, I was quite junior in, the, in this organisation. So I, I, I kind of like, uncomfortably came home spoke to my mom and mom kind of explained to me that people like us get treated differently and you know we need to kind of uh, be resilient you know as, as my, my mom's generation would say to me um, and then over time I started noticing little bits and pieces and when I left the organization I remember Sam sitting me down saying you know people who look like us and who are underrepresented in organizations that have to work a little bit harder and I always feel like I'm not adding value uh, a few months later, I misdialed uh, Sam's number and, and she picked up and her, she relapsed. Uh, sadly, her cancer had come back. And she said the last few months in the organisation had been horrific because she'd, she'd been made to feel that she didn't, wasn't performing, she wasn't adding value, or her leaders were ignoring her. Similar to Jummy's experience, you know, they were defensive, arms crossed, looking away, not having that conversation with her. Uh, she was distracted and she said to me, obviously I was distracted because I could feel the symptoms kind of coming back and I was I was trying to figure out what was going on with me, but I was still dealing with this adversity. Um, and Sam did say to me, you know, anyway, I've, I'm on sick, I'm going to heal, I'm going to get better, I'm going to try and try and get better and I'm going to go back into that work and, and show them. And, and I remember have, being quite passionate about this and I put the phone down. And a few weeks later, I got a text message of a mutual friend who said that Sam had passed away. Um, and she never recovered and that was a blow to me to be honest because I it really made me think that somebody left the planet and the earth and their legacy feeling like they weren't worthy of um excuse me um belonging uh, to this planet so mm -hmm. for me microaggressions is really important and if you are dealing with people who are struggling then you really should um step up and step out because you can make a difference to someone's life oh sorry i got so emotional <laughs> about that normally i can say that story without getting really emotional by it but uh, this is why i talk the way i talk and why i come along to these events because if anyone who's listening to this session today or watching it back on replay if you can just understand that your actions can have such a big impact on that individual and make them feel valued and loved in the organization that they work then you know, whatever happens and whatever life deals with you, you know that you've got that support that you need from people. Uh, so as uncomfortable as it might be to talk about microaggressions and as uncomfortable as you might feel about not knowing the right terminologies or the right language, or you're not quite sure, if you feel that somebody's being treated differently because of the way they look or because of their, you know, whatever, whatever reason it is, you, ha you have to step into that conversation and, and support them. And, that, and that's all people who are underrepresented are asking for, somebody who's got their back. And I wish that I did have the confidence, you know, 15, 20 years ago to say to someone like Sam that I, I hear you, I'm going to support you and I want to step up and I want to call out this poor behaviour. But I hope since then I've made up for it. And to the detriment to my career progression, you know, I have been seen as a bit of a positive disruptor. I, I put the positive in front of disruptor, other people may just call me disruptor, but I do feel like I... To be fair, I want to leave this world feeling like I've made a difference in someone's life. And if I can do that, then I can rest easy. And I think that's important for all of us to kind of take in account. And we can talk about this till, you know, till the cows come home, as we say. But it's actions that are the biggest impact. And if you take one thing away, 
from the conversations that Jimmy and I've had today is that you make a difference to the person that you're you're, you're working with because it matters and it can make a big difference to their lives as well. Absolutely, and um, we are very sadly coming towards the end of our kind of allocated hour and you're absolutely right we could talk about this and in fact we did have uh, further questions that had been pre-submitted and um, the conversation through comments has been fantastic in terms of uh, questions and there's people um, contributing now uh, on their own experiences as well. Um, we are heading towards International Women's Day on Monday um where the theme is choosing to challenge and that talks about taking individual responsibility for our thoughts and actions uh all day every day and um jammy you are on the cmi women uh committee so perhaps it might kind of be appropriate for you to um close us off with why you feel um or why you you believe you know, inclusive culture is so important and why it's important for people to choose to challenge microaggression. Thank you. Um, inclusive culture in organisation is um, very powerful and I think it's something that organisations will have, you know, taking time to invest in having diverse workforce benefited. We've seen many, many um, research and literature kind of, you know, alluding to the fact that it not, it not only provide tangible an intangible result, but also material result. But one of the advantages that I think, you know, um, many organizations kind of, you know, um, look forward to, or, you know, invest in diverse workforce for, is the fact that the reputation and the image of the organization, organizations that have that representation, um, they also benefit from external reputation, reputation with their client, their customer base, because of that representation that they have internally, but also, people that are willing to join the organization, knowing the makeup of the organization also kind of inspires them to, to want to join. So there, there was a research that I saw recently, I think it was Glassdoor for employers, and they actually revealed that 67% of um, job seekers consider um, the makeup of organization in terms of the diversity within the organization as a way to consider the offer that we, whether they take it or they, you know, they, they, they reject it. So they can benefit from, you know, attracting, you know, talents, but also, you know, creating that positive image externally, but also to increase, you know, productivity. And Forbes did um, another research recently, which was a report called the Diversity, Global Diversity and Inclusion Report. And from that report, 77% of organizations that took part in that survey actually revealed that their productivity as an organization has gone up as a result of embracing um, cultural diversity within the organization. So there are many um, factors and reasons for organization to invest in, you know, celebrating and embracing difference um, in, 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 their, in their workforce, but also innovation is also um, another key one. And it's not just, you know, bringing people who are different together, just like that, but it's about facilitating the environment where there is that psychological safety again, where people see the differences but they have the confidence that the environment encourages them to, you know, contribute, you know, their differences of opinion, of, of perspective, um, in a way that is, you know, welcome and embraced, which can lead to, it can lead to um, something called um, cognitive um, abrasion, where there is a dis disagreement in a, in a creative way, but it does lead to a, a positive way of, you know, resolving, um, um, outcomes and you know achieving the the success of the organization. So is understanding all those benefits um, that I've mentioned. So innovation, um, productivity, also a positive reputation and image for the organization. Thanks ever so much. It brings us very neatly towards the end of our hour. And thank you for everyone who uh, joined us on lunch to hear about oh. not only what's right. Matt, from sorry, Matt, sorry, can Korea. I just interject? I'm so sorry. Can I just say that we're doing a diversity in action conference? I've just seen a comment come in about where can they learn more. On the 23rd of March, through a leader like me, we're, we're going to be hosting a conference with lots of amazing speakers who have got lived experiences in some of these topics we've discussed today. So please do check out our 
uh, website. I'm sure Matt will uh, share the link as well in, in the kind of preamble afterwards. So sorry, I just wanted to, my co-founder probably will kill me if I didn't mention that. So 23rd of March, uh, diversity action. Fantastic. No, thanks ever so much. And um, yeah, we'll make sure that we do follow up with um, the links that uh, Avita and Jamie have mentioned throughout the conversation. Um, so the next uh, uh, CMI race conversation in this, uh, sorry, CMI race webinar in this series will focus around terminology and language. So we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail. Obviously, you know, we have only somewhat scratched the surface today. So we will continue this conversation as well about uh, ending microaggressions and creating better work culture. But thank you ever so much for joining us today. And thank you, Abita and Jami, for sharing not only your expertise, but your own personal experiences and um, encouraging others in the chat to have done so as well. So that's been fantastic and really very much appreciated. Um, for those who submitted questions uh, that we didn't get the opportunity to uh, address, please do come to uh, the, the, the next CMI race webinar series because uh, we will try and incorporate them as we as we progress this uh, conversation. So just leaves me to say um, thank you ever so much for everyone for joining. You can obviously find out more about CMI Race using the links that have been dropped in the chat throughout the conversation. Uh, we do have a well-being toolkit as well and a practical guide on moving the dial on race that we've drawn from today, which have also been shared with you. And if you're jo joining us for the first time, if you're not yet a CMI member, you can join our community via the links that have been shared and you can also sign up to the free CMI newsletter for all the latest trends tips for managers and leaders. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.